94b, Tzadik Dalad Amad Beis. We're in the middle of discussing Sanchei of success, unfortunate success in the northern kingdom, but the southern kingdom less so is the miracle where the night of Pesach, the night before he's about to attack, an angel comes and smites his army. And the Gemara said it a verse, which the Gemara interpreted to mean the one who's oh morning, the one who's tired out. In Torah study, that is the Southern Kingdom, Chizkiyahu, uh, won't be oppressed by the one who's constraining him by Sancherev. So in that very same verse, earlier in that verse, no sorry, later in that verse. There's another statement which the Gemara interprets in a similar fashion. So it's the last line just before the lines get wider. And the first word is loy, and the second word is mai. That's what it is. That's where we are. So mai, what's the meaning of the continuation of the verse mentioned before? Which says, Ka'esar rishen hakal, like the first time where it was very easy to be successful in oppression. Arza, Zavulun and Naftali, in the land of Zavulun and Naftali, which is the northern kingdom. But the latter one, Hichbid Derech Hayam Ever Hayardin, it's become heavy upon them through the pathway of the Jordan, or the pathway of the ocean, Ever Hayardin over the Jordan, Galil Hagoyim, the district of the other nations. So, little translation is almost uh, incomprehensible, but it seems, I think, in the literal translation, that the Pasuk is saying, that the second, uh, um, that will have less success, and it, it's more difficult in the southern kingdom, which borders uh, borders the Galil, making a reference to the ocean, but the ocean is also at the north. I'm not really sure. I don't know. How do you even translate the simple meaning here? I translated it very literally, literally, but what's like the simple meaning of the shot? In the European music is going towards the west. Right, but that's not, that's, that doesn't change in north or south. What's the uh, verse? 23 in the Isaiah. 23 what? Hey, chapter 8, verse 23. 8, 23, okay, so let's see. Oh, I opened it before. For he was not uh, worried the first time, okay. When Assyria exiled the land of Zabul and the land of Tali, but the last time Assyria will be severe. By the way, they see beyond the Jordan, the region. Okay. So it's actually referring to the simple meaning, in the way our school translated it, it means it's referring to two different times that. that Sancher of attacks. The first time he wasn't so uh, oppressive, the second time will be more oppressive. When he came the first time through the land of Zavul and Naphtali, he wasn't so oppressive. Hakel, he was lighter. The second time, when he comes through by way of the sea, by way of the Jordan, that district, he's going to be more oppressive. But the literal, literal meaning, as I mentioned before, is kind of incomprehensible a bit. And the Gemara is going to interpret it based on the fact that the, that the, from the, fact that the verse makes the simple statement in such a uh, convoluted manner means it's open for interpretation in some Jewish sense. Right? That's what the, Gemara, that's the, the, the verse will intentionally change its language to open up for more interpretations that the Gemara is doing here. He was, he was invading from the east, right? Obviously. Is it north and east? Mm, that's where he's from, northeast. Iraq is northeast from Assyria. Assyria. So, so if Assyria. he would have come from there, he would have hit the uh, northern tribes. Yeah, would have been Naftali. Uh, would have been northern, northern tribes yeah. first. Yeah, Naftali would have gotten yeah, Naftali. Yeah, they would have hit the Tiberius, like the that sea. Yeah, that was probably maybe that's the sea it's referring to. Mm-hmm. That's the, the first time he's talking about coming through the land, just coming through, like coming through today's Golan Heights, roughly. Uh-huh. And the second time he went farther south to come in. So it seems like, like going all the way down to where the Jordan. That would be the Dead, meet, that would be the dead yeah. Sea. yeah, yeah. So it seems like it's the narrow bottom end of Israel where the Jordan comes closer to the ocean. Perhaps. Yeah, or then it would be the uh, Red Sea. Where, Sorry? Where it would, it would be, be a lot and Akaba at the bottom. Yeah. Is the bottom. I mean, you've got. Yeah, but biblical Israel is not the same. Seas in the, in that area, yeah, biblical Israel is not exactly the same thing as. You have the Canaret, you have the Dead Sea, you have the like, Gulf of Akaba. The, Syrian ex- the Syrians exiled the ten tribes in three stages. The first time, the people were not so severely shocked and alarmed. But when Sanhedrin would return and uproot the remaining population of the northern kingdom, the stress would be felt much more intensely. The land is called region of the nations because so many peoples desired it. This is what. Okay, the sea here is. Yes, this is what. Barriers, 
it's, so it's it's the, the sea means the Canaries. Yeah. So it's all. So the entire verse on a simple level is talking about the northern kingdom. It's not even talking about the southern yeah. kingdom. Yeah. It's, it's, talk, yeah. it's talking about the few different times that he came okay. to the northern kingdom. And the second yeah. time, he came through the Canaries as opposed to all the way from the northern yeah. land. Yeah. means the, the, and the, the ones on the other side of the two and a half tribes. On the other side of the yeah. Jordan River. So okay. there you have it. Now right. it's first, it was inland Israel to the north, and the second time was farther was east north northeast, but northeast. more east more east in terms of the Canaries. Okay. That's the simple meaning. So it's all talking about the northern kingdom. But here the Gemara interprets it differently. As follows. Like not like the first um, peoples amongst the Jewish people that Sancherev that uh, attacked in these three stages. Which these people, referring to the people in the north, the Jewish people in the north, who have made light for themselves the yoke of Torah and that's the word here the word means it's light his attack being light the first attack with light is not a reference to like the simple meaning or beyond the simple meaning but it means that Sanchev's oppression was lighter it means the people it's a description of the people that the people took Torah lightly but the latter set of people those in the southern kingdom those under Chizkiyo Sheikh bid Allah and Alterda who took the, uh, the yoke of Torah very heavily. That's what the word hippah means, heavy. They made it heavy upon themselves. They took it very seriously. Then they were spared. And therefore, what's the continuation where the verse goes on to talk about comparing to the sea and the Jordan and Galil Gagoyim, the district of the nations, using the word Galil. So the Gemara interprets it as follows. Therefore, these, those in the southern kingdom, who have taken the yoke of Torah very heavily, heavily very seriously, it's, a, it's worthy that they should have a miracle, just like those who cross the sea, and like those who cross the Jordan. When the Jews left Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea, and when the Jews entered Eretz they crossed the Jordan, each time miraculously splitting the body of water. So the verse is referencing these two occasions to say that those in the southern kingdom have taken the Torah warning, those who are in the southern kingdom have taken the Torah, away the Torah heavily, seriously, are worthy of such a miracle, like those of the sea and the Jordan. Now, where's the last statement there where it talks about the district of the nations? Galil HaGoyim. So says the Gemara. Im if Sancheyev turns around. So Sancheyev was given permission, we mentioned before, that God gave permission for Sancheyev to invade the northern kingdom, but he wasn't allowed to go to the south, southern kingdom. He intended to, and therefore God says there was worthy of a miracle to protect the, Jew, the southern kingdom. So at this point, he still hasn't entered yet. So God says, um, boy, if Sancherev turns around, doesn't attack the southern kingdom, Mutav, great, then Lav, if he doesn't, he decides to invade the southern kingdom as he tried to, as he attempted to. And he gol bagoyim. I'm going to make him a Galil, which is the literal translation was district. But there are two different ways of understanding it now. We'll take one of Rashi's interpretation, which the word Galil comes from the word Mizgalga, which means to roll around. I'm going to make him like an exiled nomad amongst the nations. He's going to lose his land, loses everything, which he did. Because this is a reference back to the Gemara earlier, which said that because God had promised that Sancherev will invade, why was he punished? And the Gemara told us the reason why he was punished is because he had tried to attack the southern kingdom. See, here you have it. The northern kingdom unfortunately took Torah lightly they were uh, oppressed by Sancherev the southern kingdom didn't have that same demise at least not yet that came a little later when did this all happen? this is a without within a uh, let's say 50 years before the destruction of the first temple maybe a little bit more more, more than 50 years more than 100 years, yeah. more than 100 years? Yeah. I was going to say within the century but yeah, I guess they, not yeah. it's because they have the Mekdeva King Tim King Menashe and you have the that's true. Two, well, they didn't last very long, though. Menashe was a long time. Menashe was a long time, but Yeshayah wasn't such a long time. I thought I read a comment in the article somewhere that it was 133 years so that, yeah. uh, from the destruction of the first temple that the ten tribes were exiled. So it's 133 years before. Okay. Yeah, I'll take your word for it. So there you have it. So a long time before. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure they took it from somewhere, but that's that's good. Thank you. Okay. The Gemara says like this. There's a verse in the Book of Chronicles which reads as follows. After these good and true words, as Rashi tells us, the simple meaning of this verse would imply that the verse is talking about 
um, Chizkiyo. After having talked about Chizkiyo, these good and true words that the verse just finished talking about, meaning Chizkiyo, it's now going to go on to Basan Chayyim Malach Asher. Comes the king, comes Basan Chayyim, the king of Asher, by Yavi Buhoda, and comes to Judah, the southern kingdom, by Yichan Ala Arim, and he encamps himself outside the cities, Habitzurdus, the the fortified cities, by Yem Belavika Belav, and he intended to breach them for himself. That's what the verse says. In other words, it chronicles, right? Re chronicles most of the scripture, and. In describing that, it describes first who Chizkiyo was, and then it says, after these good and true words, having just described Chizkiyo, Sanchev arrives with the intention of invading the southern kingdom, and unsuccessfully. Fine. So, Gemara asks, Hai Rishna, Lahai Pardarishna, uh, I think it's pronounced the word. The Gemara is making this connection between the first statement and the second statement. In other words, it just describes Chizkiyo, and then it says, after these good and true words, comes Sanchev, as, as if to say one and follows the other. Is Sanchev, is is this the reward for this great man? He did finish describing the truth of Chizkiyo. And now you say, after this truth, now we need to Sancherev. Well, what did Chizkiyo do wrong that all of a sudden there's a connection to Sancherev's arrival? Seems unrelated. And here the Gemara's answer is going to provide a beautiful insight into how we deal with challenges in life. It's a very interesting uh, insight. So it says the Gemara, When the verse opens up and says, after these words of truth, which we describe literally to mean the description of Chizkiyahu, the Gemara says no. Acher mai, after what are we talking about? We assume we meant to talk about after the description of Chizkiyahu, that's the literal reading. But says the Gemara, no, something else happened here, and that's what the verse is referring to, some other truth that happened. Omer Ravina Ravina says, The language here is so interesting that it requires so much explanation, but I'm just going to translate literally. After God jumped, Kafatz means like enthusiastically, not literally jump, but even you see a person kafatz, like when the language kafatz comes in, let's say people are having a conversation and a third person chimes in and says something. They'll use the word kafatz, it means to jump. Like he, after God uh, chimed in or, you know, enthusiastically uh, came and said, the Nishban swore, that is, that Sanacherev is going to invade the land after God made that decision, a vow. But Amr and God says like this, If I'm going to go tell Chizkiyo, if I were to inform Chizkiyo through, through prophet or directly to him, I'm going to bring you Sancherev, he's going to invade your land, but I'm going to deliver him into your hands, he'll be successful. Had I told this to Chizkiyo, if I had I told my plan to begin with. Hashta, so now, Omar Chizkiyo would have told me, I don't want him, and I don't want this bounty. Now, what God was saying, I'm, going to do, I'm doing you a favor, I'm going to bring you some cherev, you'll be successful, and you'll have his bounty. So, Chizkiyo would have told me, keep, keep some cherev and keep his bounty. I'm happy living where I am, I don't need to deal with the whole problem. So, Miyad Kafat So, God right away jumped up, again, this language, Kafatz, and took an oath. Did my sin allay? Um, Shem took an oath? Yeah. Where God takes an oath. Where does it say this? Is this? Yeah, Is this right in the Gemara? Right in the Gemara. Yeah. Direct translation. I'm dying. I told you, the language here is so amazing that I'm giving you direct translation, but it requires tons of explanation. That means to jump. Like, feet, like. Oh, well, fine. Means yeah. to jump. Okay, okay. I, I explained before that it means like to chime in, to, to like to. It doesn't necessarily mean literally to jump. It can mean like metaphorically. Like you jump uh, an argument. Yeah, jump to a conclusion or, or jump to a decision, you know? So Miyad Kafat Sarkash Baruch sorry? Yeah, very enthusiastically, very uh, with alacrity, like very quickly. Yeah. Came to this, this, this decision, and God takes an oath, Nishba, takes an oath. To my Sinale, that I'm going to bring some Nechayrev and make Chizkiyo successful, but before Chizkiyo has time to protest and say, I'm not interested in this whole thing, I don't want the reward, and I don't want the struggle. So Shinemar, the verse reads, Nishba Hashem Tzvakais, this is a verse in Yeshaya, Isaiah. Nishba Hashem Tzvakis, God, the Lord of hosts, takes a vow. Lamar saying, If it's not as I imagine it to be, so it shall be. And as I have um, counseled, he talked him, that's, that's what shall arise. Lishbar Asher Ba'artzi, to break uh, Assyria in my land, meaning Assyria should come to its demise in my land of Israel. And on my mountains, I will break him. 
I'll trample them. The Sarma Lem Oyla and I will remove from them, from my land, the oppression of Sanchev, the Sivloy and his um another word for oppression, Mal Shikhma from their shoulder. Yes, sir, I wish I'll remove it. So Omar Birchen Birchen explains this language of Asuna, which we said before meant to trample, which is a way of saying Sanchev will come to his demise in the land. Here we can get the exact translation if you want. Um, subdue. That's I said, it's another word for breaking him. It's subdue. That's what the trans- such times else translates it. So trample. So it's a similar point. So Omar Rabbi Yechon says, Omar Kodesh Baruch God says, Yovi Sanchev, let Sanchev v'siyatoi, let Sanchev and his cohorts come, v'yasa avos lechizkiyo, and will become a avos. Avos means like a uh, a feeding ground for. Yeah, uh, yeah, like a truck with the food in yeah, yeah, like a, like a long wooden yeah. box that the animals oh, yeah. stick their heads in. So he's going to become like a feeding place. The Chizkiyo Vesatya to Chizkiyo and his cohorts. So with Sanchev versus arrival, all this wealth arrives, and when you're successful in getting Sanchev, you get everything. So this the, the simple language is that this idea of God kafats. First of all, God taking a vow. What does this mean? You, I'm just going to kind of put out bunch of anomalies that you can think about and uh, I think a little kernel I can I'll, I'll drop and we'll see where we can go with it first of all a vow is taken ordinarily like let, a vow taken a proper vow like a Torah vow like when the mission of praise is one who takes vows it's someone who knows they are liable to succumb to a certain something so they take a vow then come what may I'm not gonna give into it that's the point of a vow if it's done properly according to Torah. Taking a vow to stay away from certain things is the Torah actually frowns upon this. There's, there's all kinds of commentaries on this because sometimes the Torah frowns on those who vow God didn't um, forbid enough. Da'ach mashas l'toyah is enough the Torah. What Torah says you can't have. You have to add to what you can't have. And there are other missions which talk about like Shvua, Siogla, what's the Mishnah? Which says that someone takes a vow, it becomes like a boundary. You know? Nidarim Siogla. The priestess, like it's like it's a positive thing. A person takes a vow and it holds him back from sinning. So it depends on the context. A person's randomly uh, forbidding things in himself. That shouldn't be done. But a vow that if someone knows that it's the right thing to do, but they think that they're going to, that they might succumb to the temptation, so they take a vow to hold themselves off. So it's like a, a vow is like a heskem chazak. It's like this. It's like a, a self-imposed, super rational decision that I'm not going to go past this line. So this. So it, why do we annul them? Sorry. Why do we annul the vows um, before uh, Rosh Hashanah and then? Those are vows that are not good. Is, you know, yeah, because those are that's because, that's because off the cuff the vows, it, off the it, it's off the cuff vows we take are not positive necessarily. Oh. Right. That's why we say chutzmin midrayim shas muncha, except for a neder to make a, to fast that I've done meaning a proper neder which I took upon myself to fast a certain time. It's not. Uh, also, we're concerned a person may not follow through. Right? Initially, he was very enthusiastic, but then well, then comes right, the situation. Yeah. These things change. So, because we're well aware of human nature, like people have good intentions, right? They can't always follow through. So it's better yeah. not to over transgress the laws of uh, vows or oaths. Yeah. Right. So it's like, yeah, we just clean your slate. Yeah, you know, you may have been. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you find yourself mitzvahs, but not in a like, not like in a vow or oath right. fashion. Just so another thing here, because if you don't follow through with it, that's then, a it's, then it's a big yeah, problem. Yeah. You haven't filled what you're supposed to do. Plus, you went against the vow. Yeah. Plus, yeah. Yeah. So the, here, Hashem is vowing to bring some chayiv and then to get, deliver him to the hands of the people. It's almost as if God has this theory that maybe it's not a good idea to do it, and He's taking a vow because He's going to do it anyway. That's the implication, and it's further implied by kafats that he jumped to the conclusion, as if to say there's there's a there. He's weighing the pros and cons back and forth in his head, and he jumps to a conclusion. Kafats twice the Gemara says this language. Kafats got jumped, and what's the counter argument? The Gemara raises the counter argument. Chizkiyo would say, don't give me the problem and don't give me the reward. Just let me live. Right? And we mentioned before, we said this in the past, that when the Gemara says that God had an idea and then changed his mind, it doesn't mean really change his mind, but it means that both, both ideas are simultaneously true, one on one level and one on another level. Which means on one level, God is agreeing with, Chiz- with Chizkiyo, don't bring the problem and don't give the reward, just leave it alone, everything's fine. But then God has to cough at, has to jump to the conclusion and say, no, you know, it's better to give him the challenge that he should overcome it than have the extra reward. 
But if you would know about it, you'd protest. And if you knew about it and protested, I might actually give in. So I have to make a vow that it's going to go through. So it gives you a kind of... Uh, so I'm going to give the kernel here, and I think, the, I think this is the kernel of the whole thing. It's the way we... It's our attitude towards challenges in general. Everybody knows this. We all know this. This is, this is like a... Almost a built-in factor of life. That challenges a person go through are a source of growth. People don't have challenges, don't grow. When you're challenged and you're pushed and you face, face trouble, that's when people grow. It's the opportunity to grow. So on the one hand, God is, so if God, you know, if, if you have a parent, as a parent, you want your children to grow, right? So are you going to start overburdening them with challenges because you want them to grow? You're going to try to avoid the challenge. But sometimes you might say, okay, you know what, maybe we should let the challenge go because this is a good one. I think you can handle it. Right? So there's, a, there's this back and forth that's going on in your head when you're talking about your own children, about allowing them to go through the challenge or maybe cleaning the road for them so that they don't have the challenge, that you have to jump to a conclusion and say, sometimes at least, that, you know, okay, this is a good challenge. This is going to work out for him well. So, and if I don't give him this challenge, it's not going uh, it's, it's to be good for him. But I have to jump to that conclusion because there's the, because there's the counter-argument. The same thing is true of our relationship with Hashem and all the challenges we have in life. The challenges we have in life, at the end of the day, Hashem is giving them to us for the reward, for the bounty that comes out of it, for the growth that comes out of those challenges. So, first of all, we have to acknowledge that. The reason why the challenges are there is only that we should get the growth out of it. Keep that in mind when you're going through the challenges, knowing that at the end it's going to be, it's going to be the, the point is growth. And the other thing that you remember is, is that there's a part of God Himself which almost regrets giving the challenges. Which is why God has to jump to the conclusion, so to speak. In other words, there's some part of God's thought process that actually agrees with that agrees with Yo, maybe we shouldn't do this whole thing. Just leave it as is. So in a way, it's a kind of, um, it's like a, there's a certain, empathy is a huge, too, a human, humanistic term. But there's God's uh, uh, investment in the challenge along with you and acknowledging your way of thinking that maybe don't give me the challenge and I'll be fine without it. Right? Um, it's not a perfect analogy, but Zalman Kaplan, and this is an analogy from Rabbi Zalman Kaplan, of a child who is, the parent is forcing him to sit in the dentist chair, and he's crying, kicking and screaming, it's gonna hurt, I'm not interested. So the parent says, Here my, here's my thumbs, and whenever it hurts, squeeze my thumbs as hard as you can. Right? So it's the same parent that's forcing the child to be on the dentist chair, that's giving the child the same co the comfort while he's there, as in, like when you're feeling pain here, tell me I'm feel, I'll, I'll feel the pain with you kind of thing. So it, it, I think it's a similar thing here. It's not just God like has this you know, plan, he calmly sits back and says, okay, we're going to make the Jews have challenges and then they're going to grow out of it so it's all fine and all good and dandy. No. It, 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 God's almost on the cusp of changing his mind on the idea because, you know, well, maybe, maybe we shouldn't give them challenges and it's not worth it. And God has to jump, as it were, to vow and say, no, this is the way it has to be because they need to grow and they have to go through this to, to, get, to get to where they have to go. And maybe that explains all the, the, the kind of uh, humanistic language described here in the Gemara. God's jumping, jumping to a conclusion, taking into consideration that Chizkiyo might protest, as if like God might change his mind if Chizkiyo were to protest. So God has to jump and vow that life is going to be full of challenges, and at the same time, there's going to be growth at the end. And I'll just conclude that this connects very uh, succinctly with the Gemara, which describes a number of things that God regrets creating. One of them is God cre regrets creating the Yitzharada, the evil inclination. And the simple question is, if God regrets creating it, snap your finger and be gone with it. Like, if you regret, then what, 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 are we, what, are we, what are we talking about? So, based on what we've been saying till now, how when God has an idea and then changes in mind, they both simultaneously exist. It means currently, right now, while the Yitzharada exists, God wants to be there and doesn't want to be there. Currently. It's a very similar thing. The ultimate challenge of all challenges, not just external challenges, but internal challenges, comes from the Yitzharada. So what, simultaneously, while God says, I don't want those challenges to be there, God says, okay, this is the only way, but we have to have the challenges because this is your growth. It's a simultaneous truth. And knowing this truth gives you, gives one a lot of um, mm -hmm. both comfort and strength when, when, facing, when facing and dealing with these challenges. Like the Yitzharada itself wants you to know. Like the Yitzharada itself wants you not to succumb because that's his whole job. Its whole job is for you to make sure you overcome. Yeah, so I think that's embedded in the language of the Gemara here of God jumping to a conclusion and almost changing his mind not to bring Tiskiyoti challenges. Okay, wonderful Shabbos, everybody. Yeah, Tusa means fear.
what the Chizkiah was saying, I don't want to. Don't want to reward. Don't want to fear. Frightened by it, you know, yeah. Even though it come, overcome, but I didn't want to. Don't go, don't give me the stress and don't give me the reward. Exactly. Leave me alone. Yeah. The same with Yisurim, like Hamble of Scharim. Yeah, lema ham lem 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 a dufshach lem uktsach. That's the Gemara's language about a, about a bee. That if we had the choice, people would say, "Don't give me the honey of the bee, and don't give me the sting of the bee. Yeah. Leave the whole thing alone." But God break, creates the world not that way. There's a bee which has a sting, and there's honey. They go to go together. Sanchei fears, but there's reward. It's hard challenges, but there's the growth. And, the, and God is aware Himself is, you know, in, in earmark quotation, struggling with this along with us in the same uh, in the same conundrum. Have a good job, Mr. Sure.